Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is my great honor to introduce uh, our two uh, speakers of this panel discussion, Professor Dr. Ludger Kuhnhardt. Uh, Professor Kuhnhardt has been the director at the Center for European Integration Studies and Professor of Political Science at the Institute for Political Science and Sociology at the University of Bonn since 1997. Professor Kuhnhardt's research focuses on European integration, global role of Europe, comparative research on regional groupings worldwide, as well as topics of political ter um, theory and philosophy. Um, he's a, a lecturer at a great number of uh, internationally recognized universities and institutes, and the Bodro Wilson Center appointed him as one of its global fellows. In 2004, he was awarded the European Science Prize of the European Cultural Foundation. Uh, Dr. Gerald Bretner Messler is an advisor for external affairs to the G Secretary General, Federal Ministry of Defense of the Republic of Austria. He studied history at the University of Vienna. Uh, in uh, 1999, he received his doctoral degree. Since 2003, he's a researcher at the National Defense Academy of the Austrian Armed Forces in the field of international security politics. For his dissertation entitled Richard Reidel, uh, Liberal Imperialist, he received the Ludwig Jedlicka Prize. Um, we're, uh, I think we're looking forward to a very interesting panel discussion with two very interesting European uh, positions on the Transatlantic Alliance and on, on, on geopolitics. So what I would like to ask uh, our speakers uh, first is to draw a map for us. And I would ask uh, Dr. Bretner Messler to start with positioning Austria in the current geopolitical environment and please uh, please give us the rationale. Why is Austria neutral? Uh, we are at a conference on, trans on the Transatlantic Alliance, on NATO, um, but what does it mean to be neutral uh, in the 21st century and why a country, how does that look like uh, in, our, in our year? Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, first, let me start uh, with a heartfully Thank you for inviting me to Austria, uh, to Hungary, sorry. Uh, thank you to the Antar Josef Knowledge Center and uh, Peter Stepan uh, and uh, Solt Czepreki for having me here. There are such close uh, connections and relations uh, between Austria and Hungary. Budapest and Vienna, our capitals are connected uh, by the River Danube. Uh, and of course, uh, the, there are a lot of uh, other connections uh, between our countries deriving uh, from history, from a common history. And uh, so, yeah, it's really good uh, to be here again in Budapest. Uh, the first question goes uh, to uh, the position, to the security political position of Austria. And this is a quite interesting one. I, uh, as a representative uh, of the Austrian Ministry of Defense, uh, I'm a little bit an outsider in this conference. Uh, why? Because you're all aware Austria is not a member of NATO. Austria is a member of the European Union. Austria takes part uh, fully uh, in the structures of the common security and defense policy and uh, the common uh, foreign and uh, security policy, but Austria is not a NATO member. Austria is still a neutral country. The reason for that uh, is a historic reason. In 1955, uh, Austria got its state treaty that uh, meant uh, that uh, the occupying uh, forces uh, after the Second World War retreated from Austria and uh, the precondition for retreating the Soviet troops was uh, that uh, Austria had to declare itself as a neutral state. Uh, of course, uh, the enactment uh, of the neutrality law had to take place uh, after the Soviet troops uh, had left Austria, but nevertheless, uh, there was a political agreement uh, between the Austrian and the Soviet government uh, that uh, after the last uh, soldier would have left Austria, Austria would uh, declare itself as a neutral country. In those days, uh, neutrality wasn't popular in all political parties, uh, especially in the Social Democratic Party and also 
uh, in the so-called uh, uh, third party, uh, neutrality was uh, quite heavily discussed uh, because uh, many people feared uh, that Austria might uh, get in the end as neutral country in the sphere of the Soviet Union. This, luckily, this never happened. Uh, and uh, over the, the decades, uh, neutrality become, or became more and more, uh, let's say, a feature of the Austrian identity. Uh, that might uh, be a little bit too hard to understand uh, for somebody from outside. Uh, but over the decades, uh, the people of Austria identified uh, the neutrality with the rather successful political cause of Austria after the Second World War. Uh, that the, the economic development of Austria was a relative, uh, a very good one. Uh, and uh, also the Austrian foreign policy was more or less a successful one. Austria positioned itself uh, between the blocks, uh, between uh, the West uh, with European Union and NATO and uh, uh, between uh, the Warsaw Pact uh, and the Comic Con. As you are, might be aware, uh, in the 60s, uh, the meeting between uh, John F. Kennedy and Cruz Chauf in Vienna, this was one of uh, those cru crucial moments uh, where Austria could show it had a rather successful position between East and West. Uh, Austria became some sort of mediator. And this is something uh, that was also very popular uh, in the Austrian population. Of course, after 1989, the breakdown of the Iron Curtain, Austria had uh, to position itself uh, in a new way. Uh, the threat uh, from the East had vanished uh, and uh, uh, Europe uh, organized itself uh, politically in a new way. And uh, this was the moment uh, when there was the chance for Austria to become a member of the European Union. Before 1989, this was not possible political because uh, the Soviet Union always said uh, neutrality is not compatible with uh, being a member of the European Union. One could argue now this is true in the present time uh, also because uh, in the European Union, we now have a day a common uh, uh, security, a common foreign and security policy, and nevertheless, uh, Austria is neutral. Uh, yes, this is in some way a political contradiction. Uh, the position of Austria is uh, that we say we don't want uh, to have uh, troop stations in Austria on a permanent basis. Uh, Austria doesn't become uh, a member of a military alliance. Uh, so these are momentarily the features uh, of Austrian neutrality. But nevertheless, uh, Austria takes part, as I have mentioned, uh, in uh, the common uh, foreign and uh, security policy. NATO and uh, becoming uh, a NATO member was a topic in the 1990s uh, after the fall of the Iron Curtain and when Austria became a member of the European Union. This was the time when there was uh, some sort of an open window, a political discussion in Austria to become also uh, a member of NATO and uh, there were a lot of voices in those days uh, who were in favor of uh, Austria as a NATO member. What is uh, my analysis is uh, that uh, with the wars uh, in the 1990s, in the beginning of the 2000s, uh, with the war uh, in uh, Kuwait, uh, the war with, uh, uh, with Iraq, uh, then afterwards the problems in Afghanistan and so on, uh, let's say the political mood in Austria changed uh, and uh, the Austrian politician decided it would be more wise uh, to stay away from a military alliance and instead uh, uh, stay on the course of pure political neutrality but nevertheless uh, uh, support uh, European security policy. And, uh, 
this is true also today. Uh, political stability in Europe uh, is uh, a very important uh, feature of Austrian foreign security policy. And uh, that's why Austria is also engaged uh, very much in uh, foreign military missions, in stability missions, uh, which uh, are done uh, by the Austrian armed forces, uh, especially in uh, Kosovo and uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. The biggest contingent of the Austrian armed forces is now in Kosovo and uh, that's obviously a NATO mission uh, with uh, uh, about uh, 400 uh, Austrian soldiers. This is our biggest mission. And this is also the link uh, to NATO. Austria is a member of the Partnership for Peace uh, since 1995. Uh, so the Austrian armed forces uh, are cooperating uh, with NATO because it's in Austria's interest, as it is in NATO's interest, uh, that especially the Balkans uh, remain uh, a stable region. And this is, I think, uh, that Austria also connects, uh, obviously, uh, with Hungary and uh, with the other NATO member states, uh, and also with the member states of the Central European Defense Cooperation which I think uh, is uh, a very good uh, complementary <coughs> institution to the Partnership for Peace in Austria. We have seen this during the last three years uh, when migration popped up as a bigger uh, political topic uh, and uh, securing the borders uh, of Austria but also securing the borders of the other European states uh, became a necessity and of course uh, this is something that is uh, not done in NATO and I think uh, that's why are also our partners in the CDC are interested uh, in cooperation with Austria, especially in uh, uh, securing our borders uh, in, a, in a way uh, uh, that uh, civil and military uh, institutions work together. Yeah, maybe that's my first comment. Uh, on the situation of Austria and uh, its uh, security policy. Thank you very much. Um, so, Professor Kuhnhardt, Germany also had a um, chance to go neutral um, in after the after the Cold War. That were, there were all kinds of ideas uh, in which direction uh, German foreign and security policy would go. And of course, it is not uh, a natural country. It is uh, a part of the part of NATO. Um, after the ex after the um, um, Brexit, maybe the, the, the second largest armed forces uh, in the European Union. Um, so could you please draw um, the geopolitical map from your perspective of Europe and Germany inside it and maybe um, like what made Germany not uh, a neutral country? Like what makes like, such a, not, not such a big dif uh, difference in, in the distance, uh, in geographic distance, creates so different outcomes in, in the heart of Europe. What would the reason be for that? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for this uh, most uh, interesting uh, question, which allows me uh, to begin by really commanding the Antal Jozef Knowledge Center for organizing this conference as, at this moment in time. Because I truly believe that what we all have in common in the European Union right now is a certain myopic view on, strate on the strategic agenda of our time. And this conference is most timely to broaden our horizon and to strengthen also the strategic dialogue here in Hungary. When you asked this question, I, it, what resonated in me was a, was a lecture which I found in my archive, which I had given here in Budapest shortly after the death of Josef Antal. And, uh, it was my pleasure to give this uh, printed version in German and in Hungarian to Mr. Antal, Peter Antal, uh, uh, before our conference as a kind of a souvenir, recalling his father and comparing him, what I did at that time, with the most outstanding post-war leader in Germany, Konrad Adenauer, 
who after all represented here by the Adenauer Foundation is the second host here today. And what I had said uh, in the, in the mid-1990s I think is still very true to begin this conversation here on neutrality. I think both of these leaders, Adenauer and Antal, um, were deeply rooted in historic knowledge and recollection of, of the European uh, evolution. They were leaders of an outstanding nature to combine the development of the new with a very smart way of both coping rigidly with the past while at the same time embracing all those in their new society to begin a new and better political future. And they had a vision for each of their societies which included fundamentally their conviction that neutrality would be the wrong answer to history and would be the failure of political leadership to pursue because neutrality would mean that the lessons of history would not have been learned. And at that, that time, just in passing, I would like to mention this, I also um, said that uh, I think it is one of the tragedies of uh, uh, post-totalitarian Europe that Josef Antal died so early. Because already at that time it was quite clear to me that his legacy and that his uh, mission for Hungary and for all of us was left unfinished somewhat in terms of the socio-economic transformation for which Konrad Adenauer and his ministers Ludwig Erd and others had 15 years or so to go and as far as the evolution of a political culture is concerned which was, would have been able to move from this anti-totalitarian mindset to a post-totalitarian, pluralistic, diverse mindset, what we are trying to strive for today in Europe. And I think part also of the conversations, the critical conversations outside of Hungary about uh, certain political developments in Hungary has to do with what I have just alluded to. And then after, World War, after the Cold War, for Germany, the question of neutrality, again, was no option. <laughs> because uh, of decades of experience with the positive results of European integration on the one hand and transatlantic uh, partnership with the United States of America, there was simply no alternative to, to this uh, kind of success story. And uh, for German politics, and I believe this is the challenge also for Europe today, the real issue was how to avoid a situation in which our loyalty would be tested to be either in favor of an Atlantic option or in favor of an European option. Both had to be always reconciled and had to go together. And I still believe this is the case when we look at the security agenda today. That's my first remark. My second remark has to do with um, my recommendation to all of us to reflect a little bit about the current geopolitical context in a broader sense as we usually tend to do. I'm deeply convinced, and I have said so for many, many years, not just uh, in, in recent days, that in the long run, for our peace, for stability, for the well-being, the affluence, prosperity and freedom in Europe, the future of the global south is much more relevant than all dimensions of the former or newly emerging East-West conflict ever have been even in the most dramatic moments uh, of time. This has to do with f fundamentally one factor. Be and geopolitics is not just about geography. Geopolitics is also about demography. And the global south is simply big and strong and young and uh, enormously um, on the move in terms of its own developments. And for demographic reasons, the people in the global south, they are confronting Europe with new situations unheard of in the past or often forgotten. There are success stories who challenge us because of their success. China is one of them, probably the most prominent. Mr. Antal mentioned in his recent visit to Malaysia and Singapore, they are also on that list of kind of challengers to Western um, um, uh, Western sense of maybe exceptionalism or superiority because of their success. Then there is a good number of 
states in the global south which have failed or are, or are failing because they have not been able to um, address the promises of the nation state. And they are confronted, they meaning among themselves, people in these societies, with civil wars, uh, with conflicts which go beyond their borders. Um, and at this, on, on the third level, in the global south, especially in the neighborhood of Europe, in Africa and also in the wider Middle East, you have roughly a billion and a half people of a middle class nature which are uncertain about the stability of their own future. And this is, in fact, the real root cause of the migration pressure. And it's no surprise that this has become the most controversial issue in Europe, although we never really have gone to the root causes of this, of this agenda. And the second dimension, which is connected to the global south, uh, we can see when we have a look at this particular planet, which is here in front of us, the maritime dimension is of the essence, as much as the territorial one has always been in the period of the East-West conflict and the Cold War. The maritime dimension, and I just mentioned two, three things completely in passing, the maritime dimension includes the whole issue of the South China Sea and the need for, to pursue the freedom of uh, navigation. 80% of all goods traded in the age of globalization are traded by ships. And freedom of navigation is of the essence for our well-being. A second issue is related to Brexit. Uh, with Brexit, the European Union is losing the association of roughly half of the so-called overseas countries and territories which have been connected to the European Union so far. And they are not just about little tiny islands somewhere around the globe. They are of an utmost strategic dimension, especially in the South Atlantic. We always tend to think about the North Atlantic only when we talk about the NATO. But the South Atlantic is likewise important, which is why places like St. Helena or the Falkland Islands, which will leave the EU with Brexit, are relevant, not in themselves, because they are almost kind of staging points towards Antarctica. The, the, the climate change, global transformations, also the search for mineral resources opens a complete new chapter in the struggle over, to quote Minister Martuni, the flag. The only continent not delineated in terms of sovereignty is Antarctica. And in 2040, this is 20 years from now, the Antarctic Treaty will expire, which will open a new huge Pandora box about claims over resources, over territories, over strategic interests, etc. I can't go into more detail, but this is one of the uh, points where I sincerely regret Brexit because it will leave Europe, the European Union, almost uh, an orphan as far as positioning in the South Atlantic is concerned. So the maritime dimension is important. And all this overlaps, of course, with old power games, as we have always seen them in the East-West context. It even overlaps, in my analysis, with an, um, if I may say so, an unfinished agenda of decolonization uh, on the side of Russia and of Turkey. <laughs> and some of the almost psychological uh, um, effects of this is this return to the claim of power politics and global power po political posturing which we, which we are also uh, facing uh, out of these two countries. And what is the consequence of all of this? I think the first point, just to pick up on what Dr. Bretner Messler said, is that we are facing uh, the need to rethink basic terms, including neutrality, for instance. I mean, I have highest respect for Austria when hearing again your story about the history related to the Cold War. But I'm deeply convinced that also in Austria, nobody is neutral when it comes to genocide in, in Rwanda <laughs> or, or the failed state dramas uh, unfolding in, in Libya 
or the human suffering by people dying in the, in the Mediterranean where they were smuggled by force in the first place. So neutrality, the very term of neutrality, I think has changed its nature. Uh, and other continents have been uh, more aware or faster aware of this than many of us here in Europe. The African Union, for instance, has introduced the principle of the need to interfere, <laughs> the need to interfere in other countries' affairs if there is a grave, gross violation of human rights. Um, this happened in the Darfur context uh, for the first time in 2008. So, to sum this up, Europe, I think, is completely confronted with a new geopolitical constellation in which we also have to rethink the very logic uh, or let's say the, the very uh, consequences for NATO uh, and in relation to this for the European uh, Union. Uh, the uh, first Secretary General of NATO, Lord Ismay, is uh, very famous for this quote when being asked what is the purpose of NATO, he said to keep America in, to keep Russia out, and to keep Germany down. I think if I would update that uh, uh, phrase today in light of what Minister Martoni told us this morning about the, what you do if the substance is shrinking, namely you need to strengthen the density, in light of this uh, very remarkable uh, thought uh, we heard this morning, I would say the real challenge for NATO today in order to preserve the, the core value of collective security is indeed to keep the US in, to balance relations with Russia in, in the sense to keep them out, but also to engage with them at the same time, and to bring the EU up, to bring Europe up and strengthen Europe. That would be my modern formula. These days we are commemorating the late President George Herbert Walker Bush. I was present in 1988 when he visited Germany and called on the Germans to become a partner in leadership. And I still remember very much how even our top political leaders at the time were a bit uncomfortable with that uh, invitation by President Bush to become a partner in leadership. I think, and it's quite appropriate today as he is uh, laying in, in state, President Bush, to re remind us of this uh, quotation and to rephrase it. I think today the challenge for the European Union is to become a partner in leadership, to uh, strengthen NATO, to make uh, con complementary contributions to a stronger uh, NATO, and I think this should be the beginning of the conversation about a, um, a stronger European defense capability complementing uh, American and Canadian contributions, not replacing them, complementing them as partner in leadership. This would be my uh, geopolitical contextualization of, of your question. Thank you. Yeah, maybe a few comments on uh, what uh, Professor Kühnhardt has uh, said. Uh, neutrality of Austria. Of course, uh, Austria can stay neutral because Austria is a rather small country. NATO doesn't need in the military terms Austria. So we have uh, 9 million inhabitants. Uh, we have armed forces of 55,000 soldiers. Uh, so it's a rather small army. So I would argue that uh, Austria needs more the cooperation of, uh, or with NATO than uh, NATO needs Austria. The true, the opposite thing uh, would have, in historical terms, not be true to Germany, because uh, you can't uh, envisage uh, that uh, Germany could uh, declared itself neutral after the Second World War because uh, then a blind spot uh, would have been in Europe uh, and this would have been uh, neither acceptable for the East uh, nor for the West. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, this blind spot uh, theme uh, was also discussed uh, in regard uh, to Austria by East and West and also in Austria 
but as I have said, the uh, Austrian comparison relatively small, so this was uh, somehow acceptable for the West uh, as long as Austria didn't become part of the East and the other way around too. And what is also very important to mention, Austria uh, became uh, neutral in military terms, uh, but uh, never in political terms. Uh. Of course, uh, Austria was from 1955 onwards uh, always uh, a part uh, of the political West. Uh, and this is true nowadays also. Professor Kühnhardt has mentioned rightfully that you can't uh, stay neutral in the face uh, of atrocities uh, all over the world, uh, that you can't stay neutral concerning uh, the problems uh, we have nowadays uh, with security and with migration and so on. Uh, and uh, in this sense, uh, Austria is not neutral uh, because if I have mentioned, Austria is sending uh, nearly 1,000 soldiers abroad uh, to stabilize uh, regions uh, where insecurity and uh, destability uh, is uh, a big challenge. Uh, this is, uh, for example, also true for the Global South uh, because currently we have uh, deployed uh, troops also in Mali with the European Union training mission there. Uh, and in the next year, uh, Austria uh, will take uh, the lead function. So the force commander will be an Austrian soldier in Mali. So uh, Austria and uh, the Austrian government uh, is uh, completely aware of the international problems uh, and uh, also of, let's say, of the political obligation of Austria uh, to work together in the European Union and NATO. I would say this is somehow, let's say, a complementary deal to neutrality. Austria, on one hand, can stay neutral, but on the other hand, uh, Austria takes part uh, in uh, common uh, uh, foreign and security policy, and uh, also Austria takes part uh, in a lot of uh, military missions abroad. Of course, there are some dimensions of international security policy where Austria can't obviously participate. Uh, uh, Professor Kühnhardt mentioned the maritime dimension. Of course, Austria as a state with no sea can do nearly nothing for it. Uh, yes, Austria is sending currently also soldier to the mission in the Mediterranean Sea, to the mission Sofia. But uh, of course, uh, these are only uh, staff soldiers. So yes, I would argue Austria needs uh, the cooperation with uh, the European Union. Austria needs the cooperation with NATO. That is very important, uh, but uh, I think Austria won't become a member of NATO. This, isn't, uh, this is not politically viable, and this, I think, has also a lot to do with the history of Austria. Uh, one may not forget uh, Austria is, of course, Hungary was uh, in two world wars in the second uh, in the uh, 20th century, uh, a part, uh, let's say, of the losing side. After the Second World War, Austria was directly on the Iron Curtain. So for most people in Austria, there was a constant threat between 1955 and 1989. And this threat became also very tangible, especially in 1956 when uh, there was the intervention in Hungary and again in 1968 uh, uh, with the intervention of the Warsaw Pact uh, in Czechoslovakia. So let's say we were, all, we were always uh, on the border or on the direct uh, confrontation zone uh, of this Cold War. And of course, uh, in the mind of the Austrian people, this always meant uh, if Austria will become one a day uh, again a member of a military alliance, uh, that could mean uh, that uh, Austria could be drawn in a military conflict. Uh, 
and uh, again war in Austria, destruction and so on. Uh, and uh, I think it's quite understandable. Uh, this this was not, uh, let's say, was not a, a, a good uh, perspective for the Austrian population. So let me um, let me be the devil's advocate for just a, just a moment, because and challenge you both on the question of do countries have geopolitical horizons uh, based on their on their power on their size. So. I, so one could argue that a country like Austria or Hungary should not um, deal with the big global challenges. It should take care of or, or deal with its neighborhood and the big power should play the big power politics. Now, I don't think that that's true, um, but, but my question is, even though countries are uh, differing in, in size and, and power, uh, how could Central European countries and particularly uh, from your perspective, the Visegrad countries contribute, even though they don't have a naval force apart from Poland, um, even if they don't have that kind of capabilities that um, the larger NATO countries have. So what would be the, the most useful solution in NATO or in the European Union um, that could uh, create the most effective um, 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 support and, and denseness that was mentioned already in the, in the conference? I would say all, all countries, all member states of the European Union who contribute um, play a role in advancing the existing global presence of the European Union into the global power of the European Union. Each of us plays a role, each country plays a role in this process. Europe, sometimes through EU structures like in development aid, sometimes through strategic, the strategic presence of some of our member states, France in particular, is present globally. President Macron, for instance, will visit uh, French Polynesia next uh, spring, in March, I believe, uh, to visit uh, military bases of France, who have conducted maneuvers also this summer with Australia, India, and Indonesia. All this is about balancing China's rise in the South Chinese Sea. So Europe is present with thousands of French soldiers. But the importance of this role is not shared by many other of us, probably Germans and Hungarians including. So Europe is present, but not a power. And I think to turn this is the real challenge for all of us. And I think this is why the approach taken by the European Union last year to start this process of permanent structured cooperation, PESCO, in the field of security cooperation is, is wise, is a right, the right step forward to develop gradually, step by step, what uh, several of our leaders have called uh, the, the uh, European army. Um, in Germany, we have a proverb uh, saying that the devil lies in the detail. I don't believe that this is true with regard to the European Union. The European Union is detail every day. And everything is detail. Not the devil, but everything is detail. And detail matters. And this is why this approach of PESCO is so useful. Because it leaves room for the different approaches of different countries, different historical mindset, different experiences, different geopolitical or geographical context to come together through projects. PESCO is a legally binding um, structure, uh, now uh, finalized after negotiations in 2017. Um, in March of this year, 2018, 17 projects were identified and the mechanisms to assess the implementation. <clears throat> so this is not just rhetoric, it is about the devil in the details. It is about the details that these PESCO projects will, be, will have to be um, implemented, legally binding, as I said, and with contributions of all EU member states. Uh, and when I look at this list now of 17 uh, PESCO projects which were agreed upon by the, by the defense ministers uh, <coughs> in, uh, earlier this year, I see Hungary playing an important role and also Austria 
with regard to several of these projects. Military mobility, for, for instance. Hungary is involved here, Austria is involved. Network of logistic hubs in Europe and support to operations. Hungary is involved, along with Germany and many other countries. And uh, on the issue of cyber threats and incident response information sharing platform, sounds very technical, Hungary and Austria are involved. So both of, of uh, 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 your countries, so to say, Hungary and Austria, as well as many, many other of the EU member states, practically all except for Malta and Denmark, contribute to this development of a structured security and defense cooperation. And this is good, because when we look at this bigger, broader picture of uh, you know, the idea, the vision, let's say, of a European army, Prime Minister Orban uh, was the first to mention it, President Macron has reiterated it recently, Angela Merkel has endorsed the idea, so several of our leaders have endorsed it, but when you look at the, at the detail, especially the practical side of the matter, different economic and strategic interests come to the fore, and they have to be somehow reconciled over time. If you allow me, I mean, just to, to mention some of them, to, to break this debate really down into some practical matters. I think the core problem of developing a common European defense capability, a common European army, lies in, the, in, in diverging economic interests as far as the procurement of military equipment is concerned. This is where the devil lies, <laughs> so to say. Um, and here we see different, uh, uh, already differences coming up which will have to be addressed, but I believe there's also room for compromise over time, but one has to become very practical. So let, let, let me just run through a list of four, five, six countries here with this regard. France, to begin with. For France, the key issue really has been to enhance Europe's strategic autonomy while at the same time they know that their resources are limited, so they need other partners. Um, and they want an EU permanent frame, framework for procurement policies, which sounds easy and simple, but especially in light of the economic interests of some of the top French um, military producers, like Dassault uh, and others, who are scared of they are German competitors, to begin with. Uh, Germany is strategically much more myopic, or has been traditionally, than France, uh, but plays a strong economic role, and um, has uh, traditional uh, easier access, let's say, to partners in Central, Central Eastern Europe. As a consequence, the German defense policy, if I understand correctly, has uh, engaged very proactively um, with, in the meantime, 17 partner countries among the EU member states, out of which 22 out of the 28 are NATO members at the same time. So Germany has engaged with 17 of them through the concept, the NATO concept, of so-called framework, the, the so-called framework nation concept. That makes the French a bit nervous. <laughs> because they think this is what they call a way of Germany expanding its respiration zone, as I have read in a French report on this matter, published uh, by the Assemblée Nationale, because Germany's industry, Klaus Maffei and others, find partners buying German equipment in this respiration zone. So there's competition on the way about these questions. Then one of the issues on this list of a European army is this is the development of a common fighter plane. Can this be done? Should it be done without Poland being a partner of it? <laughs> uh, and what is the implication, for instance, of, for the Visegrad Fischer, countries, also in terms of, of economic uh, production chains uh, in this context? I think there is a role also maybe for Hungary to play. How about others? Spain, for instance, has knocked at the door of France recently and said, well, we are interested in your 
um, um, your um, 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 studies, your studies, your um, evaluation studies about the viability of this future European fighter plane. And the French reacted with reservation because they haven't heard any political commitment from Spain yet. So they're interested in the technological side of it, but not giving a political commitment. How about Italy? Can you really do all of this without Italy or run into confrontations as we see it already now with Italy having suspended the Sofia mission uh, for maritime border security in the Mediterranean? You cannot possibly organize these kind of things if, if you are engaged in permanent conflicts on, on, a, on second and third and fourth issues. And then, of course, there is the United Kingdom. I always believed that for 41 years the UK unfortunately never was really a member of the European Union. And I'm deeply convinced that after March next year they will not really be out of the European Union. <laughs> and <clears throat> one of the fields is PESCO, because the very PESCO treaty allows for cooperation with third countries in all these practical issues. I mentioned some of them where Hungary is involved with. So I'm, I'm I hope, this is more an expression of hope, but uh, treaty-based, so to say, because the PESCO Treaty allows for this, that the United Kingdom will contribute to several of these PESCO projects out of a list of 17 different aspects, which are all relevant uh, in order to build up what we like to call a European army, which are relevant, but at the same time also full of conflictual economic interest also strategic interests. And to bring all of this together, I think, is really the strategic challenge of our time for the European Union. I think it's a great opportunity, especially when I look at all the younger participants of our conference, to engage uh, and, and to connect with this discussion. I still remember 20, almost 30 years back, the debates began in Europe about the creation of a common currency. And they were as crazy and complex as this debate now is on the, the defense um, uh, profile of the European Union. And it's very logical to my mind that but for now it is the European Council who plays a very strong role in this, still on the basis of anonymity when it comes to security and defense matters, because all of this affects really the core of national sovereignty. And uh, so, in a, in a sense, the European Council almost plays almost the role of a permanent constitutional assembly of the European Union, often very slowly uh, moving forward, but probably being, for the time being, the right format to, to frame these discussions and to invite all of us as citizens, as uh, academics, as, as political observers, as practitioners, in politics and in the private sector to connect with, this, uh, with all the practical elements also of this debate because, as we said earlier, all this is very essential for and vital for a good and peaceful and prosperous future of our European Union as a strong pillar and partner in NATO. I would just add one uh, another aspect to the question, uh, to the same question, um, for Austria, is uh, a, a, um, a mechanism like, like PESCO uh, fast enough or, or is it too slow? As Austria is not participating in NATO, would Austria like to see PESCO and European Defense Cooperation move much faster than working on projects or, or even as such it's, it's enough or even too fast uh, as it's going forward, if you could also include this, this aspect in your, in your answer. Thank you. Yeah. I would say the speed uh, always depends of the participating states. Uh, but for Austria, I can say PESCO is extremely important. Uh, and as you might uh, be aware of, uh, Austria uh, is the lead nation in one of the PESCO projects uh, of the second round. Uh, for CPRN surveillance uh, that is done together with our Central European partners. It's done together also with Hungary. And uh, this is an extremely important uh, project uh, for us. And uh, yeah, if this goes on quickly, perfect for Austria. 
To your question, should uh, the small states do small things and the big states do big things? Uh, I would answer this question rather in a simple way. Uh, everybody should do that uh, what you can do best. Uh, of course, uh, Austria can only do limited things uh, and uh, has to concentrate uh, on special engagements. Uh, but uh, I think Austria is doing this, I was, would say, in a very good and concisive way. Uh, for Austria, of course, uh, the stability and the security of the Western Balkans uh, is extremely important. Uh, so this is why uh, 700 Austrian soldiers are, are uh, there uh, to make sure uh, that uh, the region stays uh, stable. On the other hand, uh, the European cooperation is uh, for a small country like Austria very important. Uh, that uh, is uh, why Austria takes part uh, in PESCO and, and why PESCO is so important. Uh, on the other hand, the question of an European army. My minister last week said uh, there will be no European army or, or he can't uh, see in the future there will be a European army. The great question, this concern for me is uh, how should this European army work and uh, how should uh, this European army uh, be uh, constituted. Uh, for me, nobody has explained that. Uh, yes, we have heard of President Macron who mentioned this topic. We have also heard of the German Defense Minister, uh, Mrs. von der Leyen, who mentioned uh, an uh, army of the Europeans. Uh, but uh, what it is about, how should it work? Uh, will this be a professional army? Will there be conscripts? Uh, how many soldiers uh, does every member state uh, send? as every member state to send a minimum of soldiers, a maximum of soldiers. Uh, what uh, if there are only soldiers uh, from uh, member states uh, that are in economic, in economic ways uh, are not uh, so capable as uh, other member states? Uh, and uh, everybody who talks uh, about European army, uh, I would like to ask him to look also a little bit in the history books. Uh, because uh, we in Austria and Hungary have a rather good or interesting historic experience uh, uh, with uh, common armed forces. As you are all aware of, after 1867, uh, the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy had basically three armed forces. A common army, the Hohenwetter, and the Landwehr for Austria. This was, uh, of course, uh, uh, to some political reason, but I think uh, this small historic example shows how complicated uh, it can get uh, to foster common uh, armed forces. Uh, and in Europe, uh, we have uh, 27 or 28 member states. Also. So I think this is a huge challenge. Uh, and uh, this is why I think it is extremely important nowadays uh, to work on projects like PESCO. Let's do what we can do now, and uh, I think there is a lot to do, and uh, it's uh, worthwhile to do all these uh, PESCO projects. Uh, I think uh, this will bring the European Union uh, much uh, far away uh, than uh, all the discussions about uh, the European army. And yes, of course, uh, your question to geopolitics, uh, of course, uh, the politics of one country is uh, shaped uh, by its position in Europe. Uh, of course, uh, Austria has uh, interest in the Balkans, uh, like has uh, Hungary, has Croatia, and all the other Central European states. Uh, this also is true for the question of migration and of secure borders. Uh, and this is why Austria, like the other Central European states, uh, have, uh, I think, a great interest in cooperation. I think this is why the Central European uh, Defense Cooperation uh, is such an important organization, because uh, it concentrates nowadays very much uh, on the link between uh, civil institutions uh, and uh, military institutions and uh, their cooperation. And, uh, this is uh, 
something to, that is not done in NATO and I think also in the European Union uh, uh, not uh, done uh, in a way that is up uh, to our current problems now. And uh, that is why uh, Austria during uh, the last six months uh, fostered or uh, tried to bring forward uh, this uh, topic of military cooperation uh, in Austria's uh, presidency of the, the European Council. And uh, the geographic position, that is also that is something true, I think, for the relationship uh, with Russia. Sometimes Austria is criticized uh, for being too friendly to Russia, but on the other hand, uh, uh, Russia and President Putin and uh, President Putin's uh, policy is a fact. And, in the end, uh, we have to talk to Russia, and I think this is also a, a historic uh, experience of Austria. Austria was always uh, the place of negotiations between East and West, and I think this is why Austria is still interested uh, in uh, diplomatic uh, conversation with Russia to make uh, Europe more secure. And I can e explain this uh, very easily why uh, Austria has uh, uh, a relationship uh, with Russia that is more, um, more keen to understand uh, the Russians. Uh, because if you see the geographic position of Vienna, the distance uh, of Vienna to the Ukraine border is the same distance as from Vienna to the capital of Austria's westernmost province, uh, Bregenz. As I saw, in fact, uh, Vienna is not so far away from Ukraine and uh, from uh, this country which has uh, this conflict uh, with Russia. And uh, so that is why the Austrian uh, position on the relationship uh, is Russia, with Russia is uh, that uh, the parties uh, should uh, come to the table and uh, talk and uh, uh, let's find uh, uh, a common solution. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I would like to turn to the audience. Um, if you have questions uh, into which direction we should take the discussion, then please raise your hands. And if there are no questions yet, I have uh, a follow-up questions question. Um, so you have been mentioning the importance of, of international uh, cooperation and, and tools such as PESCO. But of course, when we talk about the broadening of the transatlantic alliance, we usually talk about NATO accession. So my question to you, do you envision a swift broadening of NATO in, uh, in the neighborhood of Europe? Um, or if not, are there any alternatives? Like can, um, can for example, the model of Austria provide a, uh, an example to certain countries, for example, in the Western Balkans. There are many countries who have NATO aspirations. Some uh, declare that they, they have only EU aspirations. So what would be the path forward in the next 10 years? Of course, we're not in the business of, of fortune telling, but, but uh, what would be the path forward for the transatlantic um, um, alliance to, to broaden and to deepen in, on the European side of the the border. Professor Kuhn. You don't have an easier question for me? <laughs> um, how can I know, how, how does any, can any of us know what happens within the next 10 years? But uh, maybe, maybe we can take some uh, both inspiration and frustration uh, when we look back to the last 10 years, if not even more, especially when it comes to the Western Balkans. I think Europe has acted strategically extremely short-sighted in prolonging um, this whole process of so-called approximation of all the so-called countries of the Western Balkans uh, to the European Union. Um, and the consequence is that the European Union is in danger of losing a whole generation of people who have been full of enthusiasm about the European project and who are disappointed because this process uh, takes so long. One of the students in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s at my institute was uh, Antonio Milosowski, who then became foreign minister of Macedonia, 
full of enthusiasm for the European Union. He was now one of those advocating a boycott of the referendum, fed up with Europe. And I think this is a very serious indication for me to see that we are losing a whole generation there in the Western Balkans if we do not accelerate a full and inclusive membership of all the six countries of the region into the European Union as soon as possible. Even the current timeline may be towards 2025 for Montenegro and Serbia, in my view, is, is very slow, to say the least. Uh, this morning, the Lieutenant General um, spoke about an increase of FDI in Montenegro uh, since NATO uh, membership. And as much as NATO membership is really good news for Montenegro, the real increase of FDI has not come because of European companies investing there. The increase of FDI has come because of Russia and China investing. In the absence of Europeans who don't invest as long as any of these countries is not fully included in the single market, which gives rule of law and stability and cohesion to the whole reform agenda in, in that region. Already uh, almost 20 or so years uh, back with a Bulgarian colleague, Ivan Krastev, I published a paper on, uh, the, uh, a compar with a comparative view on the Baltic states and the Balkan states. And unfortunately, I must say, one could almost republish this paper today, <laughs> because what we have said then is still valid today, as far as the Balkans is concerned. We advocated an early, that means until, let's say, 20, 2010 maximum, full inclusion of all the Baltic states and all the Balkan states, both into the EU and into NATO, for strategic interest, for our enlightened self-interest, economic and political, and also for the sake of giving the right vision and future to those young people in these countries who are struggling to overcome all the different ghosts of the past. That includes nationalism, minority tensions in the Baltics, um, um, corruption uh, issues, uh, problems of, of a rising religiosity, especially among the Muslim population in the Balkans, and so on. All this was already on the wall there 20 years back. And by now, the Baltic states are safe and free and prosperous, and the Balkan region is still uh, in limbo. And I think the real reason, if you just analyze it in a comparative way, is that in the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, what has worked successfully was a combination of consistent internal reforms and very strong and loud and clear external advocacy of bringing them fully into the Western uh, integrated institutional structures, in line with Josef Antal's vision of orienting towards the West. In the Balkans, we have seen a flip-flopping of reform processes practically everywhere over the last 15, 20 years, but insufficient advocacy except maybe of Hungary and Austria always being on the side of the Balkan region. And I regret this very much also as a German, I say this for a minute here, that also in Germany there is no appetite for an early Balkan enlargement, and yet I advocate this in the interest of, the common, of, of a common European interest, because the larger security agenda ahead of us, the larger strategic agenda ahead of us really requires that we um, fill this kind of black hole there in, in this part of Europe before we are not only losing a young generation and its hope for a better future, but also will be confronted with new and very uncomfortable security challenges. Uh, I can only underline what uh, you, Professor Kühnhardt, has said. Uh, in the end, NATO membership uh, is a sovereign decision of uh, all of those states. Uh, but I think uh, what is extremely important nowadays is that we don't lose uh, all these uh, states uh, on the Western Balkans uh, for the European Union, for NATO, what else. Uh, Maybe in the Baltics uh, the situation was a little bit different. Uh, the Baltic states uh, were uh, republics of the Soviet Union, so uh, maybe 
these uh, states uh, had a strong uh, will to become independent and stay independent. Uh, I think the Baltics had enough of a patronizing uh, power in Moscow uh, who uh, took over the decisions for them. Uh, maybe uh, the Western Balkans uh, had not such an experience and uh, this is why there are some how a little bit uh, sometimes in this way and sometimes uh, in the other way around. Uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, it's uh, in all our interest uh, that we don't lose those states uh, neither to uh, Russia or to China and to, to Turkey. And uh, this is also uh, in Austria's interest and uh, Austria is very keen uh, to uh, have very close relations with those uh, states and uh, help them uh, to get uh, integrated uh, in European structures. Thank you. So um, my last question would be, um, when it, like we, we talked a lot about Europe and Europe becoming a, um, a stronger uh, uh, security actor about the processes of PESCO and other tools, uh, how this can be achieved. In terms of the transatlantic dialogue, uh, what would you think that are the most important factors that have to be done in the, in the coming uh, months, like even on, on today's, uh, at today's um, conference, we, we uh, again had the questions, uh, how, how strong is the transatlantic uh, bond in terms of, of security, may it be in NATO, may it be it outside NATO or parallel to NATO. So when you bring together the North American countries, US, Canada and Europe, what would you think that, the, that strengthening the dialogue uh, would be the most important? What tools would be uh, the most important? Well, although I know this word was used in a different context, uh, principally I would say what we need is strategic patience. <laughs> America remains important for us, no matter um, the transient profile of, of uh, a single administration. Um, America has been relevant uh, in terms of the economic ties with Europe. Investment both ways guarantees uh, 15 million jobs uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, American investment in Europe, European investment in the US. And I think all this is connected, uh, is an expression of a long-term commitment to, uh, to, to partnership in this Atlantic civilization. <clears throat> and um, in, in terms of the strategic and security role, we have heard it already in the morning during the last uh, NATO summits, in spite of all the public noise, um, the commitments to Article 5 were reiterated, uh, were reiterated. And uh, I think the whole debate, which we also had here this morning about PESCO European contributions, is also the consequence of a wake-up call, which probably many of our leaders needed uh, when President Trump uh, challenged them on the 2% uh, spending issue. But it's not just about spending. It is about looking jointly in common directions. This has often been an issue of controversy in the economic field as much as in the strategic field. And one should not be uh, naive to believe that this is going to disappear uh, any time soon. Uh, and for us here in Europe, the challenge in a way is, is more um, evident or, or closer to home than for, to Americans just for geographical reasons. Africa and its future, the Middle East and its future, uh, all this is at our doorsteps. And I don't blame any American who tells us Europeans, you need to get your acts together first. And I think that is our first and foremost uh, uh, challenge and almost duty, I would say, if we want to keep the Atlantic Alliance alive in the years to come, to strengthen our own pillar in this, in this um, civilization. And I am not, I am not um, pessimistic or defatistic as far as the whole debate about the future, so-called future of the West is concerned. There have always been ups and downs on both sides. And uh, I think for all of us here in Europe, we have learned really to understand what mountaineers say 
uh, when they reached the peak of a, of a mountain. They said, I did the mountain only when they are back in the valley. <laughs> then they did the mountain. And of course, what we have seen in the last century, that America was always climbing up further and further to the top of the mountain. And uh, with some of the challenges uh, of, of recent years, which have also translated into the domestic agenda in, in the US, I think there uh, a huge degree of uncertainty, of soul searching has begun um, because they, are, they have to go down from the top of the mountain somehow to base camp number one, where you find friends and allies and partners who have gone through the same experience. Uh, and where all of us Europeans, one way or the other, have already been uh, up and down again uh, over time. But um, I'm deeply convinced that America needs Europe and wants Europe as a partner long term, no matter the current situation. But it is on us here in Europe to strengthen our contribution to this uh, um, um, rule-based notion of a Western interpretation, let's say, of the global order along the line of what we have heard in this uh, wonderful keynote addresses this morning. And I think that should be our uh, prime focus uh, when we think of the future of the, of the Atlantic Alliance. The US will come into a situation where they realize that they have done the mountain and need friends again uh, and allies and partners in leadership uh, to address the geopolitical agenda of, of, of this uh, century. And I only hope that we Europeans, as I said, get our acts together and offer strong partnership in this uh, common Western leadership. Thank you. Uh, challenging but very promising messages uh, with which we are closing uh, this panel discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Ludger Kuenhard, Dr. G Gerald Bratner-Master for joining this panel discussion. Thank you. Please join me in a round of applause again. <laughs>